so much the first time I gave this the, the class that he thought I was going to faint or I was going to leave or I was going to escape but yet I still continued and I went till the end <laughs> so I must be brave and today I will be blushing a lot but I will do it for the glory of God anyway continue um, we will start with a prayer f one of my favorite prayers from the breviary In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with the life in you, that I may love the things you love, and do what you would do. Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is pure, until with you I have one will, to live and to endure. Breathe on me, breath of God, my soul with grace refine until this earthly part of me glows with your fire divine. Breathe on me, breath of God, so I shall never die, but live with you the perfect life in your eternity. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Um. Before we start, I think we should sing Happy Birthday to you Happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Jerry, happy birthday to you. Woo! It's tomorrow. Today, we are going to talk about the seventh chapter, the good news, God has sent his son. So basically, we will touch upon the great mystery of Jesus Christ, this person, the divine person of two natures. That's the math I present to you today, Polish, two plus one equals one. And I mostly, when I was preparing this class, I was using this book, not the one that we are using. It's called The Mystery of Jesus Christ, by, written by three um, Dominicans, because it was my textbook at the seminary, and I think it's just... I am very familiar with it, and I thought it was brilliant. That was probably one of the best classes I've ever taken. And I just wanted to let you know that what is here on these nine pages is basically combined... 90 hours, six months of what we studied at the seminary. So it's going to be just some of the th points that I cannot really touch upon all of it because we have an hour or an hour and 20 minutes. But I just selected the things that I thought were important. So you just have to trust me that they will be important for you too. Um, some of these things will be scattered. We'll be talking about a uh, few councils, the... Um, of the church, we'll be talking about a few heresies, um, some of the names you will probably never remember. I remember them only because I, I was typing this whole thing again. And just bear with me, it is pretty complicated, I will start, start slowly from general things and then go to specifics by the end, maybe touch upon the hypostatic union, most likely I will if you want to because it's pretty important. It's a great mystery. Cannot be really explained in words because our language sh falls short, and especially my language. Um, but I will try. So the person of Christ in general, very general. Now we first look into the Gospels, and the Gospels were written that all the people may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But even more, that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. That was the purpose of the Gospels. Not a nice story for people to read, not to remember what he did, but there was a purpose. It was divine, so that people knew that he was the Messiah, sent by God, Son of God, Son of the living God. That was the purpose of the Gospel. If you believe and live accordingly to this belief, you will have life a life in the kingdom of God. That is the purpose. Now, this probably answers some of the questions, why Christianity? I know many people ask, why Christianity? Why is all about Christianity? Well, because our God revealed himself through Jesus Christ in the most personal way and most common and acceptable for human beings. He simply became 
one of us. There is no other closer way of revealing his personality, his person, but by becoming one of us. So we can actually see him, hear him, know how he is. The church has come a long way from the time of the death and resurrection of Jesus to the Christology of which we speak today. A very long way. Formulating the language, the terms, fighting over them. It's 2000 history and it's still not ended because some of these truth, some of these theological um, speculations are still going and they will probably be going forever because we just cannot comprehend some of the mysteries and therefore there are mysteries. Formulation of the um, Christological language obviously was uh, coming about through the councils of the church and Nicaea 325 AD and as was mentioned last week uh, by Mark. Um, this council mostly was dealing with the divinity of Christ and the huma humanity of Christ and the heresy of Arianism, the Nicene Creed, and the word consubstantial with the Father, the word that is actually brought back by the American Church, by the USCCB, um, just to, I guess, introduce and make deeper our understanding of the Trinity by this word. Only begotten Son, not made, that is also the terminology that was a fruit of the Council, then Chalcedon at 451, one of the council, was dealing mostly with the hypostatic union, of which I will be talking later. And these and other councils, early councils, did a great service to the church, as we know, because all we have now is basically the heritage of these councils, the fathers of the church and the doctors of the church. Now, this is a very important sentence, I think, and it's a quote from the book called The Mystery of God. And it says, regarding the councils, it says, they added nothing to the revealed message, they added nothing to the revealed message, but they prevented it being interpreted in such a way as to drain it of content. And that is very important. They changed nothing about what was revealed by God in the Gospels. They just prevented people from misinterpreting the message. <laughs> The change in language did not alter the message. Now, let's talk about a little bit about the importance of Christology for us. What is Christology? It's the um, a science of Christ. It's studying about the person of Christ, Christology Christ. The Word of God. What is the Word of God? The divinity of Christ is revealed in the Scriptures, and the Scriptures saw, uh, speaks, speak explicitly, especially, especially the um, Gospel of John, when it says, the prologue of John's Gospel, in the beginning was the Word. Now we don't, it doesn't say anything about the divinity, but as we go farther, and the Word was with God, and everything was created through the Word, and the Word was God. And this is when we stop. He says it explicitly what the Word of God, the Verbum, the second person is, through which everything was created. I don't know if we have mentioned that, but you remember how God was creating the world, yeah? He said, let there be light. The words that are coming out of His mouth, this is the Word of God, is Jesus Christ creating. Through Him, everything was created on heaven and earth. Through Him, the Word, this is the eternal Word, Jesus Christ. God the Father wills it, creates it with the cooperation of the Holy Spirit for Jesus Christ. And as we talk about it later, Jesus Christ is the purpose and goal of creation. He emptied Himself and took the form of a slave. He emptied Himself and took the form of a slave, meaning became a man obediently accepting even death, death on the cross. That means that he existed before the incarnation. Because he had eggs existed, there was no beginning for him, but he emptied himself before he entered into the human state. 
All things were created through him, as I mentioned, Genesis. How was God creating? Through his divine word. He said, and it came to being. The God said, let it be light. I guess I'm going a little bit forward in my notes. And there was light, he said it. Not only Jesus is God, but also he is the son of the Father. What does it do to us? Knowledge of the Son leads to knowledge of the Trinity. The theocentrism, and this is quote from this book, theocentrism and Christocentrism denote the same reality. When we speak of Jesus Christ, we speak of the whole Trinity. Remember that this is one God always. St. Thomas Aquinas, and I like him sometimes when I don't have to study him too much, but he's brilliant. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas would later say that although it is only the Son who became man, very important, and I know it will be a little bit scattered because the mystery of Trinity has to be present when we talk about the mystery of Jesus Christ because he's the second person of, of the Trinity. He says, although it is only the Son who became man, the Incarnation is the initiative of the whole Trinity. It has to be, because they have one will. All of three divine persons, the initiative of all of three divine persons, one God. Their will is the same in everything. Incarnation. It is the work of the Father through the Holy Spirit. And now, in the encyclical Dominus et Vivificantem, uh, by John Paul II, he writes, By the power of the Holy Spirit, the mystery of the hypostatic union is brought about. That is, the union of the divine nature and the human nature in Christ, of the divinity and the humanity in the one person of the word Son. We'll talk about this later. I put a little smile here because it is kind of dense. Now, I would like to move on and be more, a little bit more specific about what was the expectation of the Jewish people concerning the coming of the Messiah. Yeah? Because as we know, they rejected the Messiah that actually came, Jesus Christ. Um, we can speculate, but it seems from at least from what I was studying and meditating upon the Gospels, it seems like the scribes, the Pharisees, actually believed, actually believed, some of them, that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, was the Messiah. But they didn't, they didn't accept Him. They didn't like what God gave to them. That's why they rejected Him. That's why they were so bitter. That's why they wanted to show their disapprovement to God the Father by killing him. And we know when we go back to the Old Testament, some of them who wanted to show disapprovement, for example, of the a story of Joseph in the Old Testament, he was thrown away by his brothers because they were jealous. But these people did not agree of, with the plan of God for salvation because they wanted a king. They, wanted to, they were proud people. They wanted to be shown to the whole world that they are the chosen race. So the expected Messiah was not really expected in the form that he came. Christ, the center and goal of all history, as the expected Messiah. The incarnation is the central event, event of the whole history of the world. Now we have to understand that the God-man, the God-man, Jesus Christ, is also the goal of that history. To understand what that means, we need to, took, we need to look at the purpose of the Incarnation. What is the purpose of Incarnation? And this goes to two different things. There is the actual purpose of the Incarnation, and there is a second aspect, and this one is not defined. The actual purpose of Incarnation is God became man to save men, and he in fact saved them. 
We will be hearing some of these statements are pretty brilliant in their simplicity. That was his purpose, to save men and he in fact saved them. Now second aspect is not defined, therefore is still open for theological speculation. And it has to do with what if. If men had not sinned, would God still have become men? And there are different answers. Some answers, right here, in the creed. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. This is the purpose. Second, in Luke's gospel. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Third, in John, in John chapter 3, God sent His Son not to condemn the world, but that the world may be saved by Him. The fathers of the church were, now this is the difficult word, I cannot say it, unin unanimously, <laughs> How do you say it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now I'm blasting. Uh, how do you say it? Unanimously. unanimously. The fathers of the church were unanimously of the view that the incarnation took place to bring salvation to the mankind. No questions there. Lumen Gentium, which means the light for the Gentiles, of the Vatican II says, that it's a truth of faith that Christ's mission, that is, the reason why the Word became flesh, was so that He may, in the mystery of His flesh, free man from sin. Now, does that mean that Christ is subordinate to men and to their sinfulness? So if Adam had not sinned, would there have been the Incarnation? And again, some say yes, some say no. Don Scotus, Scotus, I don't know how you say it, we say it Scotus, says that Jesus would have become man even if Adam had not sinned. And he gives an argument. His line of argument is based on the fact that Jesus is not subordinate to sin. The incarnation is something willed by God as the apex and highest perfection of creation in his opinion. But St. Thomas Aquinas is our favorite for now, and St. Augustine, for example, and other fathers of the church disagreed. St. Thomas Aquinas says simply, and I like what he says, of course, he said that we cannot know, we cannot know God's plan except insofar as he reveals them for us. And in so far as he has revealed for us is that he came because of sin. But that's just one of the opinions, okay? So who is Christ for us? The answer here is Christ is the greatest gift to men. That's why Christianity. That's why. In this, the love of God was manifested to us that He sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. John 3. Now, something to remember. The greatest expression of love, the greatest expression of love is the greatest gift. Simple. The greatest expression of love is the greatest gift. Christ is the greatest gift because... Christ equals salvation. The incarnation is the greatest gift individual human nature can receive, which is also a great benefit to all those who share that human nature, meaning us, human beings, all of us, because he became man. Human nature, by the fact that it was assumed, not absorbed, in him has been raised in us also to a dignity beyond compare. Talking about human dignity, the dignity of human life, how really precious it is 
because there is this divine aspect in it. That's why we fight so much for the dignity of every single human life, no matter how it is regarded in a society. And that quote was from John Paul II, from Redemptor Hominis, the savior of people, humans. And now what I said in the beginning comes from the same source. Jesus is the most understandable and fullest revelation of God to us. Why? Because he became man, one of us. No trick there. We don't have to really discover him too much. Because we know we can meet other people, we can get to know them and with some time. They can play games, they can cover their real identity, but with time it will come out. He becomes just like us, one of us, without sin though, to show us the way. God's will was entirely free to save mankind or not. And that's another aspect that speaks about him as a person, his personality, his love, what he is all about. Giving free gift, the best gift of himself for creatures who actually rejected him and don't really want to have anything to do with him anymore. He gives himself through his free will to us to be killed. So God's will was entirely free to save mankind or, or not, and above all, to decide on the way to go about it. Meaning, Jesus Christ could have saved us in any other way he wanted. But this is the way he chose, to become one of us and to die for us. Could one drop of his blood have saved us? Of course. But to show divine love, he underwent the passion. Christ and time. What do we think sometimes, it is a present thought, it's been, it's been since, since Jesus actually came to the earth. Often people think that maybe he should have come today in the age of communication, technology. Did Jesus enter human history at the right time? Well, the answer is obvious. If he is God, sent by God the Father, obviously he sees the whole spectrum of the human history. For him, there is no. It's eternity, different aspect. What did he mean when he spoke of his hour in the context of human history? Vatican II, the Council declares that Christ is the key, Christ is the center and the purpose of the whole of man's history. That is pretty clear. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and there is no other. If you expect other, you're wasting your time. Some of the Psalms say, those who serve worthless gods, increase their sorrow because they are searching for something that they will never fulfill them they will never find beneath all that changes there is much that is unchanging much that has its ultimate foundation in Christ who is the same yesterday today and forever Gaudium et Spes of the Vatican II and this unchangingness if we can say that includes human nature and its goal. It never changes. So despite the great diversity of times and cultures, man is always a spiritual and material creature, always, body and soul, despite everything else that is changing, and who can attain happiness only through knowing and loving God. Amen. Nothing else. In the history, there is only one basic point of reference, Jesus Christ. In Galatians, we read, the incarnation took place when the time had fully come. 
So there is no need to speculate if God had chosen the right time. And this is said according to God himself. The most important moment in the history ever, when God himself walked the earth, not man landing on the moon or any other historical events that can compare with, when God himself was walking on earth, that was the climax of the history of human beings. Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Revelation 21. Christ is also the goal of all history. And when we think about goal, we say, okay, I will achieve the goal and that's the end, yes? But that doesn't mean, of course, that incarnation was the end of the history. Not because it was last act, but because the new covenant in Christ is eternal and permanent. That's why this is the goal. Hebrews 9. In the spiritual journey for every human being, there is no new era to come. There is only way of Jesus Christ. Only in union with Christ, man can attain its true fulfillment. And that is why also Christ is the true and only goal of human life, to satisfy all the longings. Every moment of the history after the Incarnation does not look at Christ as something past, but as something present. Now we will go into the person of Christ, true God and true man. Christ is God and is man. One divine person of Christ in two natures, human and divine. The oneness of Christ is the great mystery. Peter's confession, you are the Christ, son of the living God. Meaning not only Messiah, but actually God himself. Now, when we think about the perfect existence and commingling and being united together, um, the inner penetration of the divine and human nature of Christ within the person of Christ, it's impossible for us to, um, to imagine that because it doesn't exist in any aspect of human life. The hypostatic union, the union between the divine, the, um, the, the natures within the person of Christ. But, and you can laugh, when I was teaching some children and tried to explain hypostatic union to children, I said to them, and it was maybe a bad example, but I think, I, I will just tell you, I, was as I asked them to think about coffee, and they walked out thinking about Jesus' coffee. <laughs> One cup, <laughs> one cup, coffee is in it, yeah? One cup can be the person of Christ, okay? Let's just don't quote me ever. Coffee there and milk and this commingling, it's still coffee in one cup. But it's now two different aspects, two different natures, let's say, of this coffee, yeah? It changed the color, it's blending, it's different but it's still the same coffee. Just what it, one ingredient with one cup, with one person, two different natures. The unici unicity of Christ's person. Now we're gonna go, I will just introduce some of the um, um, heresies of the, of, um, that were, that people came up with against this because there were I think some of them really were um, some of them were just confused because before the church actually came out with the, ter the proper terminology it was so difficult to actually speak about the two natures person of Christ hypostatic union if there was no such word 
as hypostatic, or un I mean, union was. But I think some of them, some of these um, heretics, as we call them, would have been treated a little bit differently in our times, given that they had known the terminology. Maybe it would have helped them understand what Christ really was like. The teaching of the church against some heresies. First, that was in this book, was Gnosticism, denying the humanity of Christ. The body was unworthy dwelling place for God. Therefore, it was impossible to, for God to actually dwell in the body, corruptible, so weak. Arianism, Jesus was not God because the Word was a created being and not begotten Son of God. So obviously completely missed the point. It was a marvelous being, the Word, but not God. So this person, Arian, Arian um, thought that yeah, Jesus was just outstanding human being, but not God. This heresy was condemned in Nicaea in 325, and then they, um, they added to uh, the creed, begotten, not made to defend, to make people aware. Nestorianism, how do you say it? Okay, Nestorianism. <laughs> At the Council of Ephesus, I proposed that the title, okay, this, this one was pretty interesting for me to read. Again, proposed that the title of Our Lady as Theotoko, Theotokos, really in Greek, the Mother of God, should be dropped and that the mother of Christ be used. The Nestorian duality. Um, and if you want, if you like dense books, very um, difficult to read, usually very boring, but brilliant, there is one, it's called From Christ to Chalcedon. It's worth picking up. So, Again, um, when I was looking through this and thinking about it and looking through my notes from the seminary, it really seems like there was difficulty in the language um, at that time when the heresies came about. The documents found at the beginning of the 20th century put Nestorius in a much, a um, little bit better um, light, but still. So the language was very important. Uh, to adopt the language, to know the meaning of the words that express the scripture and the tradition. Now there was this dialogue going on in the history between, between Rome and Constantinople about you know, dealing with these with this heresies. And uh, when, when John Paul II was talking to the Eastern churches, some of them were still very Nestorian. So some of them still believe what he believed. Um, that um, Jesus Christ was not God. Now, his error was that there is in Christ a divine person and a human person. Meaning for him was simple, logical, two and two, two natures, two persons. Two subjects and each sub subsistent in itself. And trust me, when I heard the word subsistent first time in my classes, and I couldn't find it in any dictionary, I was very confused, till today. The two persons are closely united, that in reality they constitute a kind of union person. That's what he was saying. Kind of union person. Kind of. It seems like Nestorius thought that every nature constituted a subject and a person. And then, therefore, Mary would be logically denied the title of Mother of God, for she would be only the mother of the human Christ, not the verbum, the divine. And Cyril of Alexand Alexandria reacted, he answered, and uh, Nestorius was condemned. Christ is one subject only, and one person only. He who is God is also man through union of divine nature and a human nature, 
Therefore, and that's the, that's the answer, of course, that's the proper answer. Therefore, Mary is truly the mother of God because she gave birth according to the flesh, to the word of God made flesh. She gave birth to the word of God made flesh, the mother of God. Now, the testimony of the New Testament, the word became flesh, John, no one has ascended to heaven, but one who descended from heaven, John again. He emptied himself and took the form of a slave, Philippians 2. And the fathers of the church, St. Augustine and Syllid of Alexandria, and I'm not going to just go to it, you can read about it. I can give you the notes. So union and distinction of Jesus' humanity and divinity. And now... Um, two heresies, monophysitism at the Council of Chalcedon, and this rejected the orthodox expression that Christ is a person of two natures. This monophysitism, with physics, one, so one person and one nature being equated. One person who is divine meant the human nature was swallowed up in divine. Which is a heresy. That's not what we believe. There is no swallowed up. One person who is divine meant the human nature was swallowed up in divine. For them, for this heresy. There has to be one person, one nature for them. Thus, to save divinity, to save divinity in, in Jesus' person, the human nature cannot terminate in a human person, but must be something totally unique from us and our nature. Now, three types of monophysitism. First is human nature was annihilated if there was only a divine nature, this would lead us to another heresy. It doesn't do any good to us, it doesn't do any good to us if there was only divine nature. Because for us to be redeemed as human being, Jesus Christ had to become a human person also. A human, he had to have human nature, one of us, the divine person, sorry. Am I understanding you to say that at this type of monophysitism or whatever, that if the human nature is annihilated, you're just going right back to the heresy of Arianism? You go back to the heresy of Docetism. 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 Which I, I did, I'm not going to talk about, okay. but that's what it is. It's called Docetism. Okay. The two natures formed... That's the second type. The two, four, two natures form a compound, a divine human nature. They could never really explain how this happened, these who came up with this. Now, Logos took place of a soul, a human divine compound. That's the third time. And this is, um, some of them think that, you know, when Jesus was on the cross, the, divinity, the divine nature left him and it was only Jesus the person the human divided you know when you divide him into the the human person that wasn't really there the human person died on the cross not God himself that's what they explain it to therefore it doesn't do any good to us okay it's just another person who is dying on the cross how can he have the power to redeem the human nature Okay. All of these heresies either deny the divinity or humanity of Christ. Or most of them. Yes. Are Basically, yes. Or constitute. <laughs> Sorry, the word. Or they made two persons of Christ, okay? Divine person and human person, kind of separated in one person, but then one, if didn't want to undergo passion, could leave, and the other was left kind of suffering. 
And there was council called and um, condemned Nos Nestorius. Council of Chalcedon um, was assembled by Leo the Great. And a few things that were said there. Person, one and the same. That which expresses unity in person. We're going to go into a little bit into psychology of a person, I guess, if you can call that that way, what it really means. In the book, there are many different aspects. Um, you could be talking about um, his awareness, self-awareness. You know, when, it, when you really actually realize when you're a person, was Jesus aware from the beginning that he was God himself, you know? All these things in his uh, human intelligence, divine intelligence, what was going on, all these things. I mean, you can spend really a whole year talking about it as we did. But how should I answer that? <laughs> I understand that, but um, I mean, I can spend time and tell you the definition of all these things and we'll not remember them anyway. Or you can just take, um, um, I can just write them down to you, give it to you, and you can study them. But right here, I don't think it's, you know, it's the proper time because we don't have to, I can spend and go through definitions and I didn't do it because... I think what I was just trying to say is, it's really stupid because I don't understand. No, it's, I understand that. and. You have a right to ask the questions. The, the problem is, um, I did not go and write down all the definitions of the, of the heresies because I am trying to explain what they meant. The definition, and I don't, I don't have the docet as the definition. I bet Mark probably has it. Do you guys have it? Would you like, because I don't know right now. I would have to look into the book. I didn't know it would be you know, something that someone would, would like to know. Okay, um, thank you very much. I think, just to, you know, don't, don't go too far with it. Basically, when I'm talking about heresies, monophysitism, all of these names, weird names, I'm just bringing up examples um, of, of people who are confused with the divinity of Christ, with his person. Basically, they misunderstood what it meant um, to be the divine person with two natures. And basically that's all it is. They just misunderstood uh, the person of Christ. And they created their own ideas. Some of them probably in a good will, but they just didn't get it fully. They were not accepted. They were rejected by the church. And that's why I am going through them, some of them. Just you don't really have to know, you know, to believe in Christ. You don't have to know all these heresies, but yes. I can interject one thing, Father. Some of you may be asking right now, well, why does it matter? Uh, and really the basic reason is that Jesus died for our sins. Now, if he wasn't God and he was just a human being, then he couldn't die for our sins because he had his own sins to worry about. And if he wasn't really a human being, if he was an astral projection or something, he couldn't die at all. So that's, that's really the one thing that if you adopt as a guiding principle, you don't have to worry too much about the details of every heresy. Yeah, and, um, and again, 
this is Christ this is pure Christology. Okay, this is for usually people who have um, philosophical background. A lot of theology, it's not, uh, you know, taught at the first year at the seminary. That's why it's so confusing. Do you think that seminarians who are sitting there, they get it the first time? No way. That's why they have six months or a year. Some of them never get it. But it's just to make you aware and explain, as um, Dr. Bach said, that if Jesus had not, if Jesus was not God, then you know, dying on the cross was just senseless for another person because he would, not he would not redeem the human nature. And that's what we want to believe. That's what it is. That's the truth, yeah? Otherwise, and all these people who created these fancy names, um, who started saying different things, were confused. And they either thought, you know, God... He was not God, so he died. It's impossible. It was impossible for them to comprehend that God would come down from heaven and suffer. For example, Muslims. I have few friends who are Muslims, and they, they simply, because we talk about God, and they simply tell me it's impossible for them to understand how God, who is there, Allah, over there, up there, you know, he doesn't come here. He doesn't search for you little creatures over there because he can step on you and that's it. That's how they believe, that God is there, out there, not here. He, he's not really that concerned. He doesn't really care for you, love you that much to come down, in their understanding. That's probably what was entering some of these people's minds. It was so difficult for them to comprehend that they came up with different ideas. You know, maybe he came, but then his soul or his nature or his person, divine, left. And this guy just was left on the cross and suffered. But it makes him a victim, really, and a loser there. Nothing else. I don't know these words either, but... I don't know them either. <laughs> but I do know that when I hear these different ideas, there's are ideas that have crossed my mind. Mm -hmm. My own questioning and doubtfulness and trying to understand. And if we're going to walk around and be Christian, other people are going to throw these ideas at us. They might not use those terms, but they're gonna they're gonna argue with us about the nature of Christ, and so by getting a grasp on these kind of ideas and why they don't work, maybe it can make us a little more effective in our path. In yeah. Our faith. Yeah, but that's why we are here to. Um, I know I may not be handling this, you know, well, but we are here to get the the idea that we, the truth that we teach which is so you can answer them what we believe. When they argue with you that this is this and that and why not, well, it's because, because God is in one person. And I think I'm going to go through it if we move on of the, um, the hypostatic union, which explains, kind of explains, I'm sorry, but this is a mystery that it's, it cannot really be explained to the fullness. Like we talked about last week with Mark, some of these things cannot be explained because I cannot give you an example of hypostatic union because it simply doesn't exist. It existed only once in the person of Christ. And I will go through it kind of to explain to you what it meant for God to be in two natures, die as one divine person, and that's it. And then you just have to believe that. Yes? I might be able to help a little bit. Just all these people back in the day, they were trying to figure out how you could be completely man and completely God, one plus one, and somehow one to be combined. Which is, yeah, it's like, it's a logic type mathematical thing. So if you don't think of it like that, then you think about it more in a qualitative way. Like, how can something be totally triangle and totally purple at the same time? If you have a purple triangle, then it'd be totally purple and totally triangle. And that's more of a qualitative than a quantitative way to think about it. It makes a little bit more sense to me. Well, 100% man and 100% God, he's got 50-50. Right, right. And that's where they're coming out with all these weird heresies trying to logically and mathematically deduce how something could be totally God. It's a mystery. 
and that's where they would um, offend either the, the human nature of Christ or the totally divine nature of Christ, kind of compromised one of the other. Now, um, I think yeah, I was gonna I was gonna talk about it a little bit later. For example, I remember um, from uh, one of our classes um, when Jesus was in the tomb, that body there, yeah, and you see the hypostatic union means that he was still the Word still connected with the body because the body would never corrupt because it's the divine person there the verbum he's still connected um i don't know let's just let's just go back you know you i may be lacking the vocabulary but uh, we're gonna just go through it slowly and i can tell you only one thing i don't know if anyone uh, is capable of explaining this i don't think it can be explained because um i went through the seminary and um it stops at some point and that's it and all I can tell you is, really, the background, the whole thing that we will be studying is, that's it. There are two natures of Christ, divine and human, and one divine person. And that's it. That's our teaching, that's what we believe, that's the truth. Everything else will be go around it. How to explain it? I have no example, because it never happened, except for Christ. He didn't explain it. Really, there are, there are explanations going through the teaching, but will it actually explain to anybody? I don't know. Now you see there are words like this. The nature are distinct but not separate. So, human nature, divine nature, in perfect union, and at the same time, distinct. Can you come up with any example to cover that one? Um, I was actually reading in our book about church and state and how our, our perception is so much that they're two very separate entities, but that the Catholics believe that the church is very connected with politics and social things. and so. People want to say they're separate, but that truth doesn't hold water. Okay, sorry, that's what came to mind. <laughs> you, you see. <laughs> I'm reading my book, darling. <laughs> no, that's fine, that's fine. Well, I wasn't really, because if I had gone with this book, then we will be talking right now about politics. Um, <laughs> regarding Christ, we would be. I don't want to go into politics. Um, no, we can. Okay, I'm gonna just I'm gonna go, just go through this what I have here, and at the end, if you have any questions, we'll try to clarify. I will get my backup here, and whoever can, will do it. You know, that's all I can do. Um, the properties, properties, and you see, this is just happening, I guess, because you just don't have theological background. What can I say? I mean, that's how the classes are broken down. You know, for Christology itself. We would probably spend the whole year studying, and then you will probably know more. The property is both, both natures as preserved in the union. So we're talking about both natures united together in a perfect way that we cannot imagine. The natures are distinct but not separate. Regarding Christ, his human actions and divine actions because actions are, are done by person. Now you see what I'm, I'm reading it a few times. Because actions are done by a person, divine person of Christ. It is Christ himself who performs the action in his person. Both human and divine actions. Everything commingled together in this perfect union in one person. I don't know, it's like having a person with two hearts, you know, perfectly connected. Two hearts, I guess. Um, the passions of Christ. Now, you know how it is with our passions, you know. They can 
take us astray, yeah? because we just feel like doing something right now. And if we don't have enough control over them, it comes from the, the uh, intellect and will, then we go after our passions. In Christ, all the passions were subordinated to the intellect and will, were perfectly in accord with His will, just as His will was perfectly subordinate to the Father's will. There's the connection in the Trinity. No sin in Him, therefore no disordering of passions. Now, I don't know if I should go to the next heresy now. <laughs> it may raise only more questions. But I really didn't expect, you know, it's good to know them, I guess, but... And this heresy says that Christ's human intelligence is being removed and the Logos is taken over, meaning the divine, the divine person is taken over whole of intelligence, that Christ did not learn anything, okay? From the beginning he knew how to um, make a table, I guess, when he was two years old. In his human nature he was learning, you know, he was taught by his father, just like us, by his mother, the prayers, all these things. Does Christ have a human will? Again, separation between the two natures, human, divine. Did he have human will or only divine will? If he came to do the Father's will, then it would make no sense if he only had the exact same divine will of the Father. Because obedient until death. You cannot be obedient without a human will. If you are, there is no redemption then. It's all connection there. Because he says, you know, he is the example of perfect obedience for us human beings to the Father. If the Son of God was not born of Mary's womb, he is not one of us, one of our race, but that is the purpose of the Incarnation. And now um, it's about Christ, the, the human will, passive and active. I don't know if I should go in that either. I can tell you about it, but it may even be more confusing. I can tell you that I, 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 it's, you can understand it. I just don't know if I can explain it to you. Um, Now the next topic is the hypostatic union. So ta-da, that's the thing. Now it can be taken from many different angles. It goes here from the philosophy, but I would have to introduce, I guess, another terminology. Let me just try to do it as simple as I can, I guess. <coughs> what it says here is substance. Okay, so nature, we talked about it last week, nature is what makes you a human being, yes? They're all the qualities that make you be a human being. That's your nature. That's our nature. Human being. And it says, what person, now think about the divine person of Christ, our person, my, your personality, my person, I am a person. My name, everything, yes, I'm a human being. So what person adds to nature, what person adds to nature, which is what makes me a person, you see, it's complicated. What person adds to nature is not in the order of nature at all, but primary to it, meaning a thing must be before they can be this or that. Meaning the personality goes first, the person goes first and then becomes nature. 
and a person is more okay the the, the more than person is more than an individual substance which is one person of a rational nature which is a human being because only human beings have rational nature we can they can think acknowledge their existence and now in other words that I don't know if it can be um, explained as subsists in in itself exists on its own and for itself that's a person that we're now we not don't talk about depending on God we just right now as standing and existing subsists in one person exists on its own for itself dependently only on God that's a human person right now again I just want to trying to uh, introduce the word subsist in a person subsists in itself it exists in and for itself depending only on God and now complete rational person substance subsists on itself that's your language <laughs> English not my language <laughs> Now this was very um, philosophical. What person implies, one person, just to understand a little bit more the person of Christ. Person implies completeness, and now that's where we, again, of the human dignity. It doesn't have to be a complete body for us to, um, yeah, you can change it doesn't have to be our repeat another big word I don't even know if I want to say it uniqueness every single person is very unique person every sense expresses um, since uh, okay uh, the uniqueness expresses the interior uniqueness of every single person the DNA and all that the dignity of a person that all goes to what implies a person. Dignity. Every single person, every single human being is a person. Therefore, dignity. Never able to be treated as object or thing or reduced to a means. We all know that this is not the truth. Okay, subsistence is the key concepts. Subsistence is the key concepts and ex existing on its own. That's what it is. Subsisted, subsists in. Um, the idea of subsisting in is also present in the Catholic Church. When you talk about diversity of churches, ecclesia communities, the other um, uh, Christian denominations. Now we say that the truth the divine truth subsists in the Catholic Church. That's what we says. The fullness of truth of, level, of revelation exists on its own in the Catholic Church. A person cannot be absorbed by another person. To understand who the human person is, to begin understanding who Christ is. Well, there you go. <laughs> so, once we understand what Christ is, then we'll understand the human person. It really is the truth. Now, hypostasis. Um, The human nature of Jesus Christ is completely perfect. Our nature is wounded. The human nature of Christ is completely perfect.
His does not terminate, our does. Now, another distinction here within the person of Christ and us. We were a human person from the first moment of existence. We were the human person from the first moment of existence. Agree? But Christ's human nature did not have that human mode of subsistence. From the first, because he existed from the whole time. But everything belonging to the human natures Christ had. Now Christ's soul had a human mode of subsistence in the human body. It had to be because he was in the human body. It needs to be this... Um, compatibility it communicated the mode of existence to the body and now going back to what I said before his soul Jesus' soul truly separated from the body on the cross his human soul truly separated because that's death yeah that's the definition of death when the soul separates from the body truly separated from the body on the cross but both his soul and his body subsist in the verbum, exist in its own, in the divine person of Christ. That's why there was no corruptibility, uh, corruption, there you go. There was no corruption within these three days. And they st the body subsists and the soul subsists even though they no longer communicate. That means death. That means the soul no longer communicates the soul no longer communicates life to the body but preserves it because of subsisting in verbum <laughs> there you go <laughs> the mystery how the word is the subsistence yet is not limited. We can go um, through the grace. Okay, the subsistence is distinct from the nature but really united. Take it as you want to. I think I'm not going to go anywhere else because on the um, hypostatic union I'm going to finish. I will not explain it in any other matter um, because I just don't know how to explain it. I understand it how I understand it but I don't have the um, vocabulary. I don't know, it's just many seminarians have failed this exam, I can tell you that. <laughs> and they are priests today. <laughs> I did not fail. <laughs> Any questions regarding anything? I will try to answer. Yes. Uh, I don't have a question, but I, I thought of one idea um, of, the, of this two in one, uh, two as one, that I wanted to share uh, called a Mobius strip. If you take a, a piece of paper like this, a step front and back, or put it down top and bottom, so two sides, if you give it one twist, a little bit small. I don't know if I can quite fit it needs to be a little bit longer. But give it one twist and put the edges together. Then, it, then you can trace over the whole complete thing. So it's it's as if it has one side. There's no longer an inside and an outside. There's no top and bottom. So I, just, I don't know. That's, that was the closest thing I could think of as of an analogy <laughs> as you were talking. So. Yeah. Hey, look, there's been a lot of. Uh, and even trying to explain the triune nature of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, there's been like analogies like 
St. Patrick used the uh, freely clover. That's how he would try to explain the unity of God, like God is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit who's sweet, but it's still like all one clover. And some people use the example of uh, water and ice and um, steam as being three different things, but all of water is the same thing. But they, at, at some point, all the analogies break down, but they're all good analogies. Kind of right. Like, You know, all of these analogies will end up in one place. It will end up in two natures and one person, you know. <laughs> well, that's, that's what it is, you know. It's not going to go any farther. Mostly all those examples of heresy that are smart totally They work for a little while. They work for some people. We still have Aryan, Aryan you know, churches, as I mentioned. But... um. Yeah, I mean, next time I can just uh, look up all of these examples and um, I guarantee you they will all come up to this. <laughs> the math doesn't go any more complicated, but I hope at least you, um, you have get a little bit more familiar with the person of Christ. How complicated and beautiful actually it is, the whole teaching. If you want to take a course on Christology, I recommend. It will be an interesting course. That was the best class I've ever taken in my life. Too bad I can. I mean, the teacher did not explain it too much more because I mean he gave more examples, but people still failed. Can tell you. <laughs> Father, yes. I, I recall the story about. I'm not sure if it's true, but St. Augustine was contemplating the Trinity, and he was on a beach. He fainted. He was trying to get away from everybody so he could think and enjoy nature. Have you heard the story? Is it true? Okay. Mm. So oh, why would I know? <laughs> he looks over and sees a little boy digging a hole and run into the ocean and filling up a little cup of water and pouring it in the hole on the beach. And he just keeps doing this. He's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it's aggravating St. Augustine because he's trying, he's losing his focus on thinking about the Trinity and he's being distracted by this boy. And he goes to him and he says, what are you doing? And he said, I'm trying to put the ocean in this hole. Goes, don't you know you'll never be able to put this ocean in the hole? And he says, and don't you know you'll never be able to figure out the Trinity? <laughs> and, and, and then it was, he was gone. As Mark said, like, you know, he said that yes, uh, last week. I, I am all for it. If you try, you're going to run into a heresy. And um, that's all I can tell you. Thank you for listening. Bearing with me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.